where the threat of uh, fracking happening, we are downstream, so we may suffer the, the consequences, but those are folks right there who are uh, run the risk of having their very environment uh, destroyed. Uh, so we're very grateful to have them here with us. And um, earlier this year, there was a terrific decision by the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in, the, in uh, New York State, and they um, decided that the town of Dryden uh, did have the right to use their zoning to um, limit uh, and ban uh, fracking activity within their locality. Huge victory uh, for local control, huge victory uh, for communities uh, that are concerned about uh, having their areas used uh, and polluted. So that was a huge victory and we're very grateful. The New York State Assembly, uh, I serve on the Environmental Conservation Committee. The New York State Assembly has passed a moratorium, so unfortunately, as we say with many things, it has not passed the State Senate. Uh, but it has passed the Assembly, and the point is to, while well, we would like to pass a ban, personally, uh, at least a moratorium puts into law what is, at the moment, a de facto moratorium. But we would like to at least have it in law. Uh, we also um, want to make certain that um, we continue to expand the number of people who are committed yeah. to this fight and, and we expand the number of people who feel that they are um, <coughs> determined to ensure that New York State stops what has been the roller, steamroller of fracking, oil and gas, we have to get away from fossil fuels, which are totally a thing of the past, and we're in the 21st century, we should be moving forward. I do want to acknowledge that we have some representatives from uh, Food and Water Watch. So, we want to, this is their latest report, so we want to thank them for being here. Uh, and without further ado, I am going to introduce our panelists, uh, and then They'll make uh, some introductory comments, and then Walter will do his um, presentation, which is, you've been wondering what that is, that's part of Walter's presentation. And after all of that, then we will have questions from the audience. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank both Walter and Eric for being here. And uh, I'll, um, You've heard Walter, uh, has already been introduced, uh, but I will just say that um, Walter, from Toxic target, Targeting. It's a uh, environmental database firm out of Ithaca that maps and profiles more than 700,000 known and potential toxic sites in New York State, which is pretty staggering. Uh, and you'll hear more about what Walter has done, but since 2009, they've compiled government information which documents the extensive environmental and public health, let me repeat, public health hazards uh, associated with natural gas and oil extraction. Um, he's also coordinated uh, a grassroots campaign involving tens of thousands of New Yorkers uh, aimed at safeguarding uh, the state from Marcellus Shale drilling. And I, on a personal note, I just want to say that Walter does this with a terrific sense of humor and a great uh, energy and elan. And I am very grateful for him to be here tonight. Uh, <clears throat> Aaron uh, is a co-founder of Shenango Community Action uh, for Renewable Energy, known as Sea Care. Uh, serves on the board of Catskill Citizens for Safe Energy and is a member of the Sierra Club Atlantic Chapters Gas Task Force and is both a resident of Shenango and Westchester counties and Aaron works at both the state and local level uh, to prevent shale gas uh, fracking from starting in any region of, the United, of, the, of New York and I will just say that there are five counties that are sort of targeted by the Cuomo administration to have 
sort of the, um, the honor of being the experiment as to whether or not this could be done properly. And um, Aaron will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's uh, Broom, Shenango, Ta uh, Tioga, um, Chautauqua, and Cotarago. Oh, Shaman. Stupid. Okay, well, that's more than five. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, uh, and we're going to hear first from Erin, uh, and then we'll hear from Walter. And uh, I want to also thank all of you because you're taking time out of your evening to be here and to participate in energizing and activating your networks of friends and associates so that we can continue to build enough uh, activity to stop the state government from uh, endangering our state as so many other states have been <coughs> actually uh, damaged dramatically. And again, I also just want to acknowledge again State Senator Brad Hoyland for being here. Thank you. And uh, Catherine McVeigh Hughes from uh, Board uh, 1, the chair of Board 1. And uh, many of you I see around have in your own right are here with, uh, at, we've just been joined by Council Member Corey Johnson. So, well, thank you. I'd like to thank the New School for hosting us here. I'd like to thank Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Glick for inviting me to participate in this. And I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to talk about the city of New York. Uh, it's not all of you have probably been to the southern tier, but when it's described as the area where fracking could begin, it's Shenango, Broome County, uh, Steuben, Tioga, and Shimon. That one got tangled up in there. And those five counties are right over the border from uh, Pennsylvania, where drilling is rampant. And the Marcellus Shale extends into that area, really a lot of central New York. Uh, the governor's plan for perhaps it to be in five counties is due to uh, the ruralness of the area, the perception that uh, it, it needs something to stimulate its economy. And I want to say a few words about what those alternatives could be. Uh, it's an agricultural area, and if you have not visited the area, it's beautiful. But it's also an area where a lot of your food is coming from. A lot of New York State <coughs> products are coming from this region. Uh, the Finger Lakes is really well known for its wineries. Uh, increasingly, breweries are taking off in New York. As you extend down into the southern tier region I'm describing, it's a lot of agriculture and dairy, primarily dairy. Uh, yogurt just became the, the state snack. Uh, Shobani is the yogurt that is being touted as sort of the state yogurt, and that's made in the town of New Berlin, which is in Shenango County, which is the area where um, my family has been for over 70 years. So when I first heard of this coming to, to New York State, I was really alarmed, and I was really alarmed by how few people were talking about it. So I started going out around the state trying to find people talking about it. And as a resident of the Southern Tier and down here in Westchester, wherever I was, I was reaching out and trying to find people. And it has really grown into a huge network of people. So I came upon Walter Hang. I reached out to him early on. Um, but it has grown. And so as you listen to this presentation, I'm just hoping you'll kind of start to consider there's risks to New York City. I know people are concerned about infrastructure across the state. People are worried about infrastructure. All of that would be paving the way for fracking starting in New York State. And even if it were to start in a limited area, it would eventually go into any area with shale. And so it's kind of a misconception that it could be contained, as well as that it would save the economy of that area. Uh, fracking is known to have a boom-bust cycle. And I can't imagine you're really going to want to be drinking the water or getting our emissions or our food from an area that would be heavily fracked as it's in Pennsylvania. Um, they go for every square mile. So instead of being agricultural, it will become industrial. And you'll see images about what industrial looks like. It's far cry from where we are now, where we could be embracing 
further farming, further green technology to those organizations. Certainly, our issues are energy and renewables would build the jobs that we need in New York and they'd stay. Okay, thank you. you all for coming here tonight. Um, Assemblywoman Blick, thank you so much. I mean, you are such an important part of the reason why we don't have shell fracking. Hey. I, mean, I also want to say thank you to my, my dear colleague and, and friend Catherine McVeigh-Hughes um, from Community Board One. She was, uh, as you'll see, very instrumental, particularly in the beginning. Um, of our fight, and Community Board 1 passed the resolution, uh, which was very, very important in holding off shell fracking um, in, in the early years. And so now, uh, we are into our seventh year of holding off shell fracking in New York State. And no one thought that was So, my name is Walter Hang. I used to live at uh, 16th uh, between uh, 7th and 8th. Uh, and then I moved to the absolute middle of nowhere, only kidding, uh, to Ithaca, New York, and I started a company called Toxics Targeting. So you can go to ToxicsTargeting.com, and you can see that we've compiled local, state, and federal government information on, as uh, Assemblywoman Glick noted, more than 700,000 known potential toxic sites just in New York State. Uh, so this is a classic example. This is the infamous 30 million gallon toxic spill in Greenpoint. And so over here was a 100 year old uh, refinery, which was originally um, essentially mobile corporation, and uh, now I think it's BP. And so the tanks leaked, and there's this massive plume of contamination underneath hundreds of homes and buildings, and it'll essentially never be cleaned up, and, and that's what my company does is we compile the data on these kinds of sites, mainly for uh, engineers and consultants, but also for the City of New York uh, drinking water supply system. So uh, this is the biggest uh, report I've ever generated, uh, and this is in southeastern Queens, where 500,000 people traditionally have consumed water drawn from the ground. And uh, this area had extensive contamination involving this chemical called methyl tertiary butyl ether, MTBE. And it was originally added to gasoline, <clears throat> in theory, to allow the gasoline to burn more cleanly. The problem is that if you have a gasoline leak and it hits groundwater, it just sits there, floats on top of the water. But if that gasoline has MTBE in it, then the MTBE dissolves in the groundwater and it migrates away from the source of the spill. And so this area became enormously contaminated, and all 53 well fields, <clears throat> excuse me, operated by the city of New York, I think were either threatened or impacted. And with my data, the city of New York uh, won a hundred and three point million dollar settlement against against ExxonMobil, <laughs> which I charged them more for the report. <laughs> So I live in Ithaca, New York, and it is right on top of the Marcella Shale Formation. And that's like right around here is where it starts, and it goes all the way to Tennessee. So New York has had almost a 200-year history of oil and gas extraction. But as you can see, it's all out in the southwestern part of the state. So other areas have very, very little. These are the drilled wells. And so this is what it looks like in the field. So traditionally, these wells involve just drilling straight down, and then you either hit a pocket of gas or oil, or you don't. So you can see over in this area, there are a gazillion wells, right? And, and so there's a lot of oil and gas over here. But you see over here, zilch. So that is the, what the conventional drilling looked like, and we've had literally hundreds of thousands of these small wells that were drilled, 
and then they would, as they say, play out in a couple of years, maybe three to five years, there'd be no more gas, no more oil, and they'd plug them or just abandon them. So this is the Marcella Shale Formation. And you can see it goes all the way out to Ohio, and it goes, as I noted, south to Tennessee. Uh, and, and so basically, this is what they call a tight shale. So traditionally, this shale, if you drilled into it, you did not hit a pocket of oil or gas. And so they never exploited this kind of shale. And so then they developed new techniques. So this is about a mile deep on average, and it's about 400 feet thick. So they drilled down to the formation and then through the formation. And then, I forgot to mention one key thing. See this green area over here? So that's on top of the Marcella Shale. And that's where your drinking water comes from. So 90% of your drinking water in New York City comes from what's called the West of Hudson system. And that's that green area that you saw. So if Marcella Shale fracking, where again they drill down and through and then they pump this fluid into the well bore under tremendous pressure and it expands the rock, not very much, about a quarter inch, but it can crack the rock literally for thousands of feet. <clears throat> And then this fracking fluid has sand in it. And the sand gets shot up into the cracks. And then when that fracking fluid basically goes up the well, the sand holds open the cracks. And then the gas starts coming out of this tight shale. And so this was proposed in 2008. And as was noted, the key thing is, is as Aaron said, it's a vast industrialization. It essentially, involves drilling up to 16 wells every square mile. That's the only way to do it economically. So you no longer have wells in one area and no wells in other areas. You would have wells throughout that entire Marcella Shale formation. So the first five counties are where they propose to start. But ultimately, it would engulf that entire region, including where your drinking water comes from. So the reason we don't have any shale fracking anywhere in the state of New York is because the state of New York said in 2008, okay, we're not going to allow any fracking of Marcella Shale until we adopt comprehensive public health and environmental safeguards. But they basically said, as a result of New York's rigorous regulatory process, the types of problems reported to have occurred in states without such strong environmental laws and rigorous regulations haven't happened here. No known instances of groundwater contamination have occurred from previous horizontal drilling or hydraulic fracturing projects in New York State, close quote. So they said, we only need to supplement the 1992 generic environmental impact statement that was allowing about 15,000 active wells to have been drilled. And, and some fraction of those were fracked, even though they were just vertical wells. Uh, and so, as you know, the rule in this kind of work is, is trust but verify. So they said, we've never had problems, and so I went to check that out. <laughs> So first, let me explain what you know it looks like. So this is a fracking operation for a single well. And so you can see it is one big industrial operation. So the main thing is they build this gigantic impoundment, like a giant lagoon. You need five to seven million gallons of fracking fluid just to frack one well. So you have all these incredible compressors and trucks to bring the chemicals and the sand uh, to the site. And you can see it's, it's usually in the absolute middle of nowhere. And then this is the device where they pump the fluid under tremendous pressure down into the well. And they do it section by section. And they essentially perforate the well casing. And then this fracking fluid shoots out into the rock and it cracks it. 
And so I basically went through the Department of Environment Conservation's own spill data to see had there been oil and gas extraction problems documented. So this is the first one that I really found. Uh, so you can see um, it's Dale Fox Gas Well, and it was in 1996. Call it concerned about water well. Drillers drilling nearby caused problem. Drilling east and one mile away, caller has never had problem till today. Fire department on scene, uh, caller concerned about impact. Dale Fox drilling gas well, <clears throat> was actually an oil well, on Bixby Hill Road, Freedom, New York. Natural gas escaped through fault in shale. Affected properties approximately one and a half miles southwest on Weaver Road, town of Yorkshire. Gas bubbling in Ron Lewis's pond. Bubbling in ditch west side of Weaver Road. Twelve families evacuated. Gas in Lewis's basement built on shale. Farmer's Well in Barn, 11708 Weaver Road. Uh, Steve Wallace invented to outside gas coming up through ground in Lewis's yard. So to translate what DEC wrote, Dale Fox is drilling and he hits a pocket of pressurized gas. The gas comes blasting up out of the well. And the problem was the wind blew this gas aerosol, this very flammable material, onto his drilling operation. The machinery is very hot. That's how come you frequently get fires and explosions. So he didn't have any ability to shut off this release of gas. Usually what you do is you pump what's called mud, this drilling fluid, into the well bore, and eventually there's enough weight of this mud pushing down that it prevents the gas from shooting up. The problem was that the gas got in a fault in the shale, and it went a mile and a half in like seconds. And through incredible bad luck, where it came shooting out of the ground. Imagine if you saw someone kind of laying on their back with a Windex bottle, you know, <laughs> shooting that aerosol. It was just coming out of the ground all over the place. It was coming out of drainage ditches, coming out of ponds, and it got into these people's wells. And I said, Mr. Lewis, how did you know your well got contaminated? He said, oh, the water turned black, because the Marcellus Shale is black. So they've never been able to drink their uh, water uh, again, and they received the settlement, uh, but it, again, it didn't fix their water. Here's an example. One of their valves broke, causing about 100,000 gallons of brine solution. So when you drill the well, you produce this briny, salty, toxic, radioactive material. It's called produced water. It's otherwise known as brine. And so the biggest problem that I found is that these brine spills would occur all the time, and they were never properly cleaned up. Some of this got into Shenada Creek, so it would just flow across the landscape and get into rivers, creeks, and they would just never clean it up. There were thousands of these. And so I told, uh, basically, the Press and Sun Bulletin, the state's depiction of a clean, <clears throat> tightly regulated natural gas industry just got a shot of muck in the eye. So this contention that they never had problems, everything was fine, we were almost ready to go, was just not true. Then I found this guy who lives, I think, in, in Cander, New York, which is not that far from me. He's a Vietnam uh, vet, and I literally, all I did was I sifted through the Department of Environmental Conservation's own data. And I found this guy who reported that they were doing an, an exploration for natural gas around his home, <clears throat> and it impacted his water, and suddenly he began to have methane gas accumulating in his water, and so I went out to visit him, I bought a camera at Best Buy, and this guy's water would literally explode in flames if you held a match to it. And so you can see there's a video at ToxicStargeting.com about this guy, uh, Fred Mayer. So I told the Daily News, there he is lighting his water. Yeah. And then we got coverage in Israel, and we got coverage in Hong Kong, 
and we got front page coverage in uh, all the regional papers of Guinea. And so basically this guy appealed not only to the Department of Environment and Conservation, but to Andrew Cuomo, who is the Attorney General. And, and Andrew Cuomo wouldn't even send a scientist out you know, to visit this guy and say, well, what, what's your problem? You know, you can see the video, but you know, basically he didn't lift a finger, and this guy still has methane gas problems, and he is a Vietnam uh, vet, and he's a, a Purple Heart winner. And I just think it's disgraceful that our government doesn't help the people who have had the kinds of problems documented by DEC, you know, in the areas where this uh, welling has been um, essentially very common for decades. And the reason they won't help is because the, the agencies are skeletal remains. The Department of Environment and Conservation was once the leading environmental protection uh, agency in the country, but now there's no one to go into the field to deal with these problems. Enforcement is tremendously lax. So then, after <clears throat> I found the initial set of problems, they said, well, you know, there aren't really that many, there are only 270. So I started looking for more. So 200 gallons, doesn't meet standards, still administratively active after 2011. They're not cleaning up these problems. More brine, 2010, doesn't meet standards, 700 gallons, valve on five tank, frozen, broke. You know, so they, they actually closed this one out even though it didn't meet the applicable standards. You get the idea. They're just releases of this toxic radioactive brine all the time in the areas where this kind of activity is going on. So it's, it's basically clear that the DC, in fact, has not protected um, people living in these areas from these kinds of contamination hazards. Here they use wood chips to soak up the oil, again, never cleaned up. Crude oil, 200 gallons, doesn't meet standards, still administratively active. So this is the way that the DC has essentially been dealing with these uh, concerns. Then they actually allow brine to be spread on roads to control dust. They also spread this toxic, radioactive, salty brine uh, to melt ice and snow in the wintertime. Because again, it's very, very salty, but mainly it's toxic and it's radioactive. So when I was a kid growing up in the Hudson Valley, they used to spray oil on dirt roads to control dust. Out in western New York, they're spraying millions of gallons of this toxic brine on roads, and you can actually see maps of where this practice is authorized. <clears throat> so one of the other things I found is that the county authorities are actually charged with responding to the local spill. So this is um, Chautauqua County, I believe. And you can see they just have hundreds and hundreds well impacted by brine. No recommendation given to the homeowner about what to do with well water. These people are just basically screwed and no one's helping them. And it's been going on for decades. And this is the government's own information. Advice to boil water used for consumption. What is that going to do to remove radioactivity and toxic chemicals? When you boil water, that's just to kill bacteria. The reason they have so much contamination is because this toxic brine, in many cases, is dumped into these little lagoons. So here you have the produced water, and it's just dribbling into this lagoon, and this orange material is essentially weathered petroleum. And so this actually recharges into the ground and causes groundwater contamination. And this practice was supposed to be banned 25 years ago. I know you're shocked. It is still going on to this day. And so citizens are basically alerting me to these problems all the time. So I am schlepping out to the most remote areas you can imagine, visiting these horrible brine pits. So you can see this weathered petroleum you can see this whole area is just caked with toxic oil. And you can see there's a drainage pipe, and it just denuded this hill. And then it got into a little drainage ditch, which went into a small uh, stream, which actually, I think, feeds into the Genesee River. So this could be replicated all over uh, the state of New York, where shale fracking is proposed, if the regulation is lax. And as you know, most of the oil and gas mining in America is done in very arid areas where there's no water, like West Texas. 
right? So when you start doing it in a place like New York with a lot of water resources, you can have a lot of problems. This is a family where they um, had a well, and someone was drilling or fracking a well about 1,300 feet away. Their son was taking a shower, and oil came blasting out of the shower head and doused him. It totally contaminated their toilet, their dishwasher. That's the residue in the bathtub. And again, this site was never cleaned up in compliance with the applicable standards. These people are elderly. You know, they're just left to their own devices. It's really shameful. This is a guy, Dave Ferrugia, <clears throat> and uh, he is near Jamestown, New York, high in tone, and he also got contaminated. The thing with Mr. Ferrugia is that he had this guy, William Boria, for the Chautauqua County Department of Health helping him. So he said, Mr. Uh, Boria said, this is a well-documented case showing drinking water impacts that are seemingly related to gas well development, right? And so he tried to actually get the DEC to give Mr. Ferrugia a water that wasn't contaminated, and he totally failed. And this is 2009, so Mr. Ferrugia still doesn't have clean water. But what he does have is testing before the gas well went in, after the gas well went in, and you can see <clears throat> chloride went from 3.8 to 223. Uh, let's see, chloride, let's see. Oh, excuse me, that was, yeah, chloride. So it's hard to read from that. Here. Total dissolved solids went from 362 to 1,000. So this is very strong documentation showing an impact after the wells went in. They were within 1,000 feet of his house. Uh, but again, it didn't help him get uh, water. This is a, a Mennonite named Dave Eddy, yet again, living in the middle of nowhere, Andover, New York. There's his well. And you can see that U.S. Energy uh, communicated their test indicated trace amounts of oil and recommended the installation of a carbon filter that takes out the toxics. Uh, so they put in the filter. They put up Mr. Eddy and his family in a hotel because his very young children were taking a bath when the company across the street fracked and this came blasting out into the tub where the children were. They were like two in one. The house filled with gas. They thought the whole thing was going to blow up and they ran for their lives. Um, so they had to stay in a hotel. They offered Mr. Eddie compensation and he, and he refused because it, it's against his religion, believe it or not. And again, this was documented by the Allegheny County Department of Health. Uh, prior to about four months ago, his water well provided water of very good quality. However, at, at that time, allegedly after U.S. Energy had done some gas well fracturing, drilling approximately 1,000 feet from his home, he began having water problems that included muddy water, oil in the water, and a gas smell to the water. And again, Mr. Eddy couldn't get DEC to help him. So again, to this day, he's still living with that problem. Mr. Eddy claimed that U.S. Energy went through the water table twice as a result of concerns he expressed to them after this when he started having problems with his water. They tested his water, would not provide him with the test results. They told me he didn't have any contamination, but as you can see from that letter, they gave him a filter. So around this time, you know, remember in the background, the DC says, yeah, everything is fine. We have never had a problem. We're good. And so we have been organizing people to write letters, the most powerful weapon in, in politics, right, in public policy, to basically say to the DC, your draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement is totally inadequate. It cannot protect New Yorkers. And we were you know, really putting the pressure on them. And then we basically got Ian Urbina at the New York Times to write this absolutely epic a series called Drilling Down, Regulation Lacks as Gas Wells Take Water of Its Rivers. And so he wrote about mainly the problems in um, Pennsylvania. And you can still go to this Drilling Down series. You can see these incredible maps that I helped him make. And the key thing is he got this one amazing PowerPoint presentation by this uh, EPA scientist named Amy Burkdale. And she had called me right after she saw Fred Mayer's um, video 
And she wanted to know if I had the same data for Pennsylvania that I had compiled for New York. And, and I couldn't really understand what she was saying. She was talking like a mile a minute. And I began to understand that there was some kind of problem in Pennsylvania that really no one knew about. And so Ian Hermina got this PowerPoint that was shown uh, to the heads of EPA. And the bottom line was in 2008, there was a big drought. And this is the Monongahela River. It's near Pittsburgh. And so on October 10th, this power plant failed air emissions requirements uh, because they had too much total dissolved solids. And they then found out that the river itself had too much total dissolved solids. So the total dissolved solids, you recall, are in the fracking wastewater. So it turned out that when Pennsylvania said, oh yeah, we're good to go, we have no problems, start fracking. All that amazingly contaminated wastewater went into sewage treatment plants, municipal treatment plants that were not designed, constructed, or maintained in any way to break down this toxic, radioactive, very, very salty material. So all the total dissolved solids just went right through the plant into the receiving bodies of water until 850,000 people couldn't drink water drawn from the Monongahela River. This was the biggest drinking water fiasco in the history of the country, and no one knew for a long time that it was associated with fracking until Ian Urbina came along. So you can see, this is it, 2008, and so the, the TDS level was going up, 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 and then they were saved. It started to rain. And in this case, dilution was the solution to pollution, and they were able to drink the water again. So with all of this information that we compiled, we were battering Governor Patterson. And on this, in December 2010, he signed an executive order saying that the draft desk guys had to be revised. And so the moratorium continued. When I originally wrote a letter and tried to get you know, people to help me, withdraw and kill this draft desk guys, the big environmental group said, Walter's strategy has a quote, snowball's chance in hell. And then we actually got it. And so this <laughs> revised draft desk guy still has not been adopted. So then we got a new governor and we started writing him again. And you can see I took all those little examples that I showed you and I included them in a very respectful letter, which he didn't respond to. <laughs> And I laid out the 17 reasons why the revised draft desk guys is inadequate and shouldn't be adopted. But then I got more than 22,000 people to sign this letter. And so all told now, we've gotten like 50,000 plus people to just constantly pressure the governor uh, not to adopt this final S guys. And that's how come the de facto moratorium is continuing. And there's Aaron helping me put pressure on fracking, uh, I mean, the, on Cuomo supporters. We just did this again. So originally we sent letters saying kill the S guys to a thousand uh, supporters. That took a lot of envelope stuffing. So this time we did 500. And uh, these are the people who contributed $25,000 or more. It's Carl Icahn, Donald Trump. It's one of the Koch brothers. You know, the infamous people who want fracking all around the country. And so we're, I also want to point out, here's Ben Perkis of New York Residents Against Drilling. Here's Matt Ryan, uh, the former mayor of um, Binghamton, who got term limited. This is Sue Rapp, uh, who's trying to stop uh, fracking in Vestal. And so we've just organized an incredibly powerful coalition. We just keep compiling new data. We torture the governor and the press. We get more press coverage than you can shake a stick at. And the main reason why there is no fracking in New York, really, when you get right down to it, is the citizens. And as you know now, there's a Department of Health review. The governor got cold feet in 2012. It looked like he was going to do it, and then he chickened out, with all respect. So he then tried to buy off the big green groups because they were concerned about public health impacts. So they wanted an independent health assessment. He said, you're not going to get that, but we'll give you a review of the health impact analysis in the revised draft S guys. We said, we're reviewed that. It's terrible. It's inadequate. 
And then he did it anyway. It's never been written down on a single piece of paper. And we've just been battering the governor on this every single day with the help mainly of the New York State Assembly majority. Um, and, and so here's um, me with my former uh, colleague, um, Pete Gratis, a great member of the Assembly the Econ Committee, who was the uh, DC commissioner at the time, and he told me, don't go after me, <laughs> go after the governor, because he's trying to cut you know, my staff, and that's why he quit, because of a secret memo saying the DC couldn't protect public health because of the cuts. Uh, and so this is uh, Catherine McVeigh Hughes, in another very tasteful outfit, um, <laughs> meeting with Joe Martens. And these are the grassroots activists who have learned to be very sophisticated. And, and we really tag team Joe Martens that day. Look at me, and I knew him when he was Mario Cuomo's environmental advisor. He said, the last time I saw you, I didn't have a single gray hair on my head. I said, Commissioner, we're lucky to have any hair at all. <laughs> so he has just, his hair now is white. He has really been put through the ringer. And of course, here's the assemblywoman with her colleague Robert Lipton. Um, and it, I mean, it's just been Michelle Schemmel, I mean, so many, you know, others. I think Danny O'Donnell, uh, Matt Ryan. And here's one of my incredible favorites, James Brennan. I mean, just, you know, the assembly is the leadership that we desperately need to counterbalance a governor who almost certainly wants to frack. Um, and, and so we really, we need good people. It all comes down to a handful of good people doing the hard work, doing the heavy lifting, and that's how come we have survived. This was the day, by the way, that Andrew Cuomo was reported by Danny Hakem in the New York Times to want to do a demonstration project just in those five counties, right? But once it gets going, you can't stop it. The money is too intense. And that plan, believe it or not, was proposed by one of the biggest environmental groups in the country, Natural Resources Defense Council. So while we've held it off in New York, Oil and gas due to fracking has skyrocketed all across the country. It's just gone up enormously. And the A number one formation is the Marcella Shale. But here in New York, annual gas production boomed and then it went bust. So we're back to the same level from 25 years ago. And in the last year, only one conventional gas well was permitted. <coughs> one. So they're dying out. And finally, crude oil production has dropped to the lowest level in 100 years. So the entire oil output in all of New York State wouldn't even fill a backyard swimming pool on a day-to-day -day basis. So against this background, while we're holding off shale fracking, we could actually be the first state to actually halt all fossil fuel extraction. <laughs> and I'm here to thank Assemblywoman Glick for her leadership and to thank her and her colleagues, and that's why we've survived for going on seven years. But the biggest test is to come, um, because the governor just said last Wednesday, that he wants to complete the Department of Health review by the end of the year, even though it's secret, even though it doesn't have any public participation, even, even though it's based on five years' worth of ancient data. So we're going to have a really big fight on our hands, and it's your drinking water that is at stake. There is no deal to safeguard New York City's reservoirs. They could get fracked. It's not likely, but we have to be ever vigilant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive review. Um, I do want to point out that one of the things that we're concerned about, and I believe I see another colleague, uh, Assembly Member Brian Kavanaugh in the back. <laughs> we have seen in the last five to six years an enormous number of, we've had a hundred year flood, 
We've had a 300-year flood. We've had a 500-year flood. And in all of those circumstances, if you just took a walk over to the Hudson River, you would see a chocolate brown river because the runoff from the Catskills downstream demonstrates clearly that the floods that are happening upstate make this, even if you don't think that the wells are dangerous, there's no way to protect them when a flood occurs and rips open the ground. And in 2006, there was a flood that ripped a hole through a four-lane highway with a substantial median, and it left a gap that was just about the size of the seating area. And that was there for a number of months while they had to reroute traffic. And that's the kind of thing that would open up. So when they talk about it being safe, or you don't have to worry about containment ponds, everything is protected, there's no way, considering the way in which the climate's changing, that any of that could possibly be safe, let alone everything that Walter's told us about what's happening underground. We see what happens above the ground, let alone what happens underground. We're going to have uh, some, uh, if you have specific questions, we're going to hand out cards, you can write them down. Um, and uh, we're going to start off with a couple of other just general questions to the panel. Um, since I've mentioned climate change, do you have some thoughts on how uh, the, this process Pencil. Pencil. could affect or accelerate climate change? Yes, it, uh, it definitely contributes. Uh, the methane emissions alone from pipelines is just incredible. Uh, uh, NASA just found an area um, out west that shows from space the incredible amount of emissions that are contributing. So methane is um, even stronger than CO2. It'll contribute a great deal more. And there's a professor at uh, Colgate, who, um, or Cornell, uh, Dr. Robert Howard, who's that's his main thrust of the argument against fracking is it will accelerate it and accelerate climate change. And um, it's the, the area that is definitely not being argued enough. And New York State really needs to look very closely at his work as well as you know, what their stand is going to be. Inside. One of the things that's happening is that natural gas is now available in, in such massive volume that the price has plummeted. And so many power plants are actually being proposed to be retrofitted to burn natural gas, for example, instead of coal. And so the payback on that investment is 50 years. So when you begin to see these conversions, um, then you're locked in for 50 years to burn this fossil fuel that's going to contribute to climate change. So this is the tipping point. It is right now, you know, they've begun fracking all over the country. We haven't, but we can still adopt the strict liability, private right of action, uh, financial surety requirements where they say, oh, we've never had a problem. It's like, okay, well, you'll then be afraid of being fully liable for the comprehensive cleanup you know, to make all the victims whole if heaven forbid a problem occurs. Um, and obviously, you know, there are many, many battles before this all gets set up. Uh, we've heard uh, in other places uh, about the impact on farm animals, especially out west, where people uh, have had herds that have gotten sick. Uh, but could either of you address the concerns about wildlife because a lot of this is being planned for spaces that are, you know, off the, the beaten path and that's in fact where we have a lot of wildlife and there hasn't been a lot of discussion about that. Yes, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, particularly upstate in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of areas where if it's not just agriculture, it's tourism and recreation that are driving the economy. And those areas are often going to hunt, fish, 
Um, they're seeking out places to do that. And if there's also fracking, it draws a question what kind of shape those fish would be, like, for example, the Mahanagila River. Um, based on that data, I would have been very concerned if I'd been a fisherman during that time. Uh, there's a, a problem, too, with the, I know the deer are really attracted to the brine. And so it's certainly, I mean, they go and they, they start licking it. So it's something we need to think about with all animals, whether it's um, domestic animals that we're raising for, for some kind of production, if their water's tainted, that's certainly a problem, and then the wildlife. So, especially with the, the images of the water pouring off, the releases, it draws you to question what would be going in to your animals. The deer, like many animals, love salt. You know, so where I grew up in the Hudson Valley, you would have salt licks. You would just put it out in the, in the fields and animals would come and lick the salt. And so, as Aaron noted, when you have those pits, when you have this material spread on roads, the animals are attracted and they literally lick it, but they don't realize that in addition to the high salt content, which I documented, it's also radioactive and it's toxic. So those contaminants concentrate in the animals and it can ultimately impair their health. And Cornell University is actually doing work on this. We've heard that there are uh, large subsidies that go to oil and gas, and yet this, some of this is being pitched as a way to be energy independent and protect our foreign policy. Uh, what kind of subsidies do you think we might be able to attract to renewables, uh, or the use of renewables uh, to actually spur um, some kind of economic boom for farmers who right now don't see any. So we could be growing biomass. Are those things that you are hearing on the ground? Well, uh, particularly in Shenango County, we've been talking a great deal about solar. Uh, there's a number of solarized programs that are taking off. Uh, solarized Madison, which is a county nearby us, has been very successful. Um, there's been some initial steps towards the solarized Shenango. Solar would be perfect up there. It's really wonderful. Some areas of the state are also good for wind. The issue starts to be the scale to which you would be speaking about. But um, one thing we're pushing in Shenango would be community-owned solar. So if it's not ideal in someone's house, they could be contributing into being part of uh, a solar farm. So it's the scale. There's been some resistance to wind along those lines. But um, as long as the scale is small. Now, if you have installers who are trained locally and live locally, that's money that's going to stay locally versus oil, gas, where it's a very uh, transient workforce. We're going to take, we now have a, a lot of questions from you all, and we'll try to get to, uh, to as many of them, if not all of them. Um, my building wants to or is thinking about going from oil heat to natural gas heat. Is there any natural gas that does not come from fracking? And can a user choose where the gas comes from? Uh, essentially, the answer is no. So there is gas all over the place that's being produced, and it all goes into essentially a centralized system. And so you can Google these pipelines. There are gazillions of them. I mean, they are everywhere. And so once the gas is in that system, it's going to go wherever the demand is. And, and right now, the demand is so intense uh, that they are building out the infrastructure. I will, however, note there's no question that oil, you know, number two fuel oil, is toxic, and it's enormously problematic. I'm adding about 4,000 uh, sites to my database every quarter, and most of those are petroleum spills, notably from underground tanks that have corroded through and leaked. So the bottom line is, you know, we're, we're pretty much addicted to these uh, types of fossil fuels that have enormous public health and environmental impacts, and we really have no meaningful plan how to make the transition. And, and so I'm a big believer in planning, and so there are lots of alternatives, but as Aaron noted, 
the scaling up is very challenging. There's no question about that. I mean, all the sustainable alternatives are only about maybe 6% right now. But in California, for example, so sustainable is reported at like 20%. So we don't know how far we can go. We don't know how we can do that. And that's another very, very important you know, policy discussion that's needed. Since fracking involves several toxic chemicals, what impact does it have on the air that we breathe? It has a pretty significant impact on air. I'm sure you can you know, go on YouTube and you can see where people have infrared meters. I mean, this is an industrial activity. So again, the fracking itself, it has additives that make the water very slippery. That's why they call it um, slick water hydraulic fracturing, right? But the main problem is what comes up out of the well. You can see the fumes are incredible. Now, if you're doing this in the absolute middle of nowhere, again, dilution may be the solution to that kind of localized pollution. But we're talking in Pennsylvania since 2008, 6,300 wells have been drilled and fracked. In Colorado, they're fracking 3,000 wells a year. I just flew out to California last week, and at one point I looked out, it's a very arid area. I think it was Colorado, and there were there may be a thousand well uh, fields. I could see them plain as day. Um, so this is a very, very big problem, and, and air quality, unfortunately, it has not been properly addressed. I mean, shot through this by the revised draft desk guys. Uh, they've pretty much ignored that issue. Well, this is a political question. Um, is it important to work for an extended moratorium uh, or a ban in the New York State Senate? What do you think is the best strategy? Now, personally, I will say that in most fights uh, with large institutions, whether it's the government or NYU, um, <laughs> you have to run down every avenue. So. You don't pick one thing and put all your eggs in one basket. You have to do more than one thing. So, of course, next Tuesday is a very important day. Uh, I think if the Senate, uh, the state Senate becomes truly democratic, um, it will be uh, an easier lift. And then the pressure, since the Assembly has clearly been uh, in the right place on this, uh, with a Democratic State Senate, we would be able to uh, counsel the governor. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that Walter and many people in central New York are really fighting the battle uh, to prong, uh, having localities ban it, uh, because they now, the uh, State Court of Appeals has uh, said that they could. Um, and then also fight on the environmental front. And those of us who've been around in New York a long time know that Westway was uh, defeated on environmental grounds, and that is uh, another way to go at it. Any thoughts? The most important thing is that the de facto moratorium that we currently have uh, until a final Geis is adopted is unlimited. It could go 20 years, it could go 100 years. It's just going and going and going. So it's, it's already entered the seventh year, okay? On the other hand, it could end like January 3rd. It could end any time. That's a couple of this horrible, brutal. Um, so I really believe what we need to do as much as we can is kill this Department of Health review. No Department of Health review, no final escites. That's what the governor said. And instead of doing this, pathetic review of a document we know is terrible, we know it's five years old, we want a comprehensive public health impact study. In fact, the Assembly passed legislation in, in that regard. That can be done openly, transparently, with full public participation, with any amount of luck, it would take like nine years. So during that period of time, you can develop all these wonderful alternatives that people like Aaron really care about, and so many of you care about, but you know, you've got to get that going. But if fracking begins, you know, it's going to hit us like a tsunami. And I would just like to add to that that I, there's a lot of talk about different strategies, but I think the common factor 
across everything that people want, moratorium, ban, uh, withdrawal of the SKIs, is that we want to slow this down so we don't see the tsunami coming at us. So I don't really see a big difference between the ban and the moratorium messaging. It's the SKIs I believe we have to focus on, and it's withdrawal to protect all of them. Yes, and when, uh, just a reminder, when you're writing your letters to the governor, keep that in mind, uh, that uh, that may be um, our uh, strong suit coming out of, uh, out of this evening. Old regulations like forced pooling or compulsory integration, which essentially you are surrounded by, um, there's a, 600, 640 acres. 640 acres for an area, and that could be, you know, five landowners, it could be 15 landowners. And you may be opposed, and a few others may be opposed, but remember, this goes down and then across. So this could be under your land, even though you are opposed. Are there any plans or any strategies around changing these rules? Actually, there is some hope on that front. Uh, so compulsory integration is something fairly new to New York uh, in that you hear about out west people not having their own rights. Well, it's the beginning of that sort of happening here. In fact, that is happening to people who are trying to their own rights and sell property as well. And compulsory integration would make it so even if you're opposed, if enough land around you is, your property will be engulfed into that spacing unit. And um, that's really a problem. And upstate, we have one of the most uh, pro-fracking senators, Senator Tom Lewis. He's been in office for a very, very long time. And he has a challenger, uh, Andrea Starzak, is challenging him, him. And we're very excited about it, particularly because she's decided she would take on compulsory integration because of how much it's concerning people. A lot of those leases that were signed were without people knowing what they signing on to or understanding uh, what fracking was. And so there's increasingly reservations and awareness and uh, uh, a <coughs> urge to make sure it doesn't happen or sweep it through like that. Another issue that um, folks upstate, uh, we've gotten a little bit of traction on it. When you get your uh, a mortgage for your place, if you get the mortgage based on being residential, uh, and you sign one of these leases, you're agreeing that at some point it might be a commercial operation. And then your mortgage could be at risk. And in fact, banks don't want the liability of commercial development. Plus, you get a different rate if you have a residential mortgage rather than a commercial mortgage. So there are issues that we've tried to raise with uh, the Department of Financial Services around the fact that people have not been provided adequate information about how uh, much their uh, mortgages are at risk if they sign one of these leases. And of course, the kindly uh, leasing salesman uh, doesn't tell you about these details. This issue really came to light because banks in Tompkins County were very concerned about this issue uh, and that they couldn't sell their um, mortgages, the loans, on the secondary market. You know, they usually bundled in securities, typically the next day. And so when they finally had a meeting with local officials, notably Barbara Lifton, uh, later that, I guess the next day, one of the presentation packets somehow wound up underneath my door. And so, of course, I told the Ithaca Journal. So th these are very profound, very sweeping issues that we've tried to get the governor to deal with, and he will not deal with these issues. And so it's, it's one person fighting, particularly you know, elected representatives, trying to get the governor to deal with all these financial issues, environmental issues, sustainable energy issues. And I always say it's like talking to the Sphinx, right? He won't talk to us. He, we don't know what he's thinking about. And that's how come, with all respect, we need to crank up the pressure. So there's nothing more powerful than a handwritten, knowledgeable note. However, those are very hard to crank out. So you can go to ToxicsTargeting.com, 
click on any one of the coalition letters and we have this beautiful email template. So in the beginning, you can write to your heart's content. You can say anything you want. You can spell your concerns. But then at the bottom, you echo this message to kill this Department of Health review, kill the revised draft desk guys. And so this is very technical, uh, you know, very, very complicated language. And we are just deluging the governor with these. They're very powerful. In the next few days, you know, he's going to wake up in a cold sweat uh, just thinking about this. Uh, and that's why we're going to give you an opportunity uh, as you're leaving to draft one of those letters and then we will put them uh, in the mail for you. Uh, and they'll go out uh, first thing tomorrow. So uh, we'll, we'll give you that opportunity uh, on your way out. We have uh, what looks like loose leaf paper. Just uh, doesn't have to be a, a long involved uh, message, but it's stop the yes guys and <coughs> we need a full appropriate public health review. Um, what can you tell us about the Utica Shale? We've heard so much about Marcella Shale. What is Utica Shale? Utica Shale is another tight shale formation. It's underneath Marcella Shale. So whenever you hear about the 640-acre spacing unit, they always say you can drill up to 16 wells. So typically, eight of those would be Marcella Shale, which is more uh, uh, carbon-rich, has more petroleum constituents and natural gas. But the Utica Shale is much thicker. And so it can, the other eight would go into the Utica Shale. So these are both tight shale formations that traditionally have not been economically rewarding. Um, and, and so they're both going to get exploited. Has there been, and this is probably more uh, a local question, is there any education directed at city officials to stop the massive push towards gas fired boilers in the city. Now, the reality is that the last administration uh, actually uh, said as a way to reduce our uh, air pollution in the city, we would move from oil to natural gas. Um, one could be a cynic and say that there may be um, holdings by the Bloomberg LLP uh, in, uh, but it's, it, it's changing one uh, fossil fuel for another, but I do believe that uh, the point in New York, as you say, getting things up to scale uh, for renewables, um, especially in an urban environment, is very tricky. I mean, that's why you're here, right? You're political activists. You actually care about public policy. I mean, people like, you know, Catherine McVeigh Hughes have actually, you know, made an amazing amount of progress. I mean, you got a new mayor, right? Go talk to him. You know, you need a plan that you can organize around. The reason that we have held off shell fracking is because we have this amazing coalition, literally hundreds of groups, you know, Cornell professors, very esteemed researchers, but we have, you know, advocates like yourselves. I mean, you can shape the outcome of elections. You can determine who's going to win and who's going to lose. And you can determine how we're going to power our economy in the decades to come. All these decisions are on the table. You know, and so I'm not going to be my normal cynical self and say, oh, you would never pass that. That's crazy, right? You know, I, I worked in the legislature for 12 years, right? It's tough, right? But these are, are challenges that you know, we have to be. I mean, it's happening every day. So you don't want oil and you don't want gas in New York City, you know, you better get going, man. I mean, this is it. Like, come up with a plan, start advocating, make it happen, no excuses. But first, the longer we hold off shell fracking, right, the more pressure we bring to bear on the governor, then the better the horizons for alternative development. Because otherwise, if we develop all the shale gas, man, it's going to be really hard. It's going to cannibalize a lot of the alternatives. Aaron and I met with Bobby Kennedy, and that's exactly what he said. You know, it, it's going to have a locking in effect for decades to come. So you want sustainables? Now is the time. Don't wait a day. There's no time to be lost. This uh, member of the audience spoke to a Sierra Club member from California who says that during their drought, which continues, uh, when LA residents have to limit water use, 
when farmland has to lay fallow because there's no water, 12 wells that are being fracked are using 8 million gallons of water per day. What can we do to protect the usage of our water? Well, first of all, in, um, again, localities, uh, in Cooperstown, they have a beautiful, beautiful lake. Lake Otsego is um, the uh, glimmer glass of uh, James Benamore Cooper's story. And uh, there were frackers who came and said, well, that looks like it's a pretty big lake. Can we use your water? It is the water supply for Cooperstown. And they said, absolutely not. Cooperstown also is home to the, Hays uh, the National Baseball Hall of Fame, not noted for its political activism. <laughs> the Baseball Hall of Fame has issued a memorandum of opposition to fracking because they see that as a danger to their community. Uh, and um, they, it is all about tourism for them, and they see that as an industrialization that would not only endanger their water supply, but also damage their entire uh, economy, which is totally uh, dependent on uh, the um, both the tourism and also Omegang Brewery. Uh, and Omegang also said, if there's fracking here, we will leave. And they are a very, very important part of the economy in that area, and they depend on a clean, uh, high-quality water uh, for their product. Uh, we also have raised the issue of our food shed, not just our watershed, but our food shed. The state has made, and the city, and this is something also I think for all of us to bring home to uh, Mayor de Blasio, we have made big investments in green markets and bringing local food into our communities. And as Erin said, that food comes from <coughs> Uh, the southern tier. Uh, if you go to any of our green markets, you will see many of the farmers who are here. Uh, and maybe it doesn't hurt to say you're, when you see them, we're happy you're here. And we're happy that the food you're providing has clean water. And maybe you can take that back to your local representatives that we love to have the food, but we want to make sure that it's not in danger. Regarding the Baseball Hall of Fame, that wasn't an accident. So the owner of the Baseball Hall of Fame is Jane Forbes Clark. She's uh, the heiress to the Singer Sewing Machine fortune. In addition to the Baseball Hall of Fame, she owns the, the Dakota Apartment Building. She owns the Otisaga Inn. I mean, this woman carries a lot of weight. And she has a family foundation called the Scrivens Foundation. So this is all about knowing who the people are, knowing the secret handshake. I went to a meeting at the Scrivens Foundation with this woman who had like, the, I mean, this Chanel outfit. I mean, my mother went to Parsons School of Design. It was like incredible. It's like $5,000 outfit. And then we got there and we talked to the Scrivens Foundation and we got them on board. And I, they, it just was filled with artists. Wow, this is really nice artist. I've been back from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in for a few years. So these are heavy hitters. You have to have friends. That's the name of the game. Reward your friends. Punish your enemies. Catherine McVeigh Hughes is a Princeton-trained engineer. She went to work for Nyberg. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable. She just showed up one day. So you've got to build your networks. It's all about the coalitions. It's all about reaching out. Signing those letters, coming up with a plan, making it happen every day. We're in a trench warfare fight, and we're doing well. That, but we're here to find more people. We're desperate, so help us out. Uh, on that note, we have a question for somebody that there's obviously clear evidence that this isn't about energy independence, but rather uh, overseas sales. And um, there is a concern about the uh, liquid night natural gas uh, port projects that are uh, planned in Long Island Sound. There's one that was uh, discussed for uh, off of the Rockaways. Um, what, in your conversations with people, is that on their radar screen? Oh, I think it's a huge issue for people, uh, particularly as 
we're all being encouraged to convert to natural gas. Um, in the back of everyone's mind really should be why are they trying to get us all dependent on it and where are all these pipelines going. Um, a lot of it's headed for export and I think there's strong evidence that when export begins, because there might be a demand, particularly like this is like Japan, we need alternative energy sources, the consumers of that gas will be paying a higher price than we've traditionally been paying in this country and our prices will go up. So while you're being told to convert, and a lot of residential homes, particularly in Westchester, I know everyone has gas is just where they have to be, but those prices will go up. So the thought that it's more economical um, will radically change when export um, stations take off. There, right now, there's like 14 applications in to convert import stations to export, and a number have started to be approved. And so these pipelines are really headed through the state. Um, the gas won't necessarily stay local, which is one of the misconceptions of state. People thought, well, I, I'll be able to benefit from the well in my yard. And that isn't going to be the case at all. I would only say one cautionary thing. These are very tough fights because it's almost impossible to halt them. They're allowed, you know, so trying to stop them like the local Spectra pipeline fight, people work like dogs and then they didn't win. So as local activists, you have to think very, very hard about how you use your resources. And so there's no question, if fracking begins in New York, we're doomed and we'll never turn it back. I mean, it's going to be very, very hard. It's been a miracle that we've survived so far. So you can't tell people, oh, don't worry about that compressor station proposal, you know, in your own community. But the key thing is to have an overarching view that if the final s guys is adopted, it's going to be amazingly worse. Um, I see that there are people who are slowly filtering out, um, and we do want to make certain that, you know, if you have to leave, that you're going out and and writing a quick letter. So we're going to have somebody out there. So if you have to leave, just take a few moments. It won't take long, and it's really what we need to do. Uh, we'll do a few more questions. Um, what what rationale did NRDC give for its support uh, around gas drilling? I've known the people at NRDC for almost 40 years. I was married to a woman who worked for Francis Beinecke. I worked at Francis's father, Walter Beinecke's desk. I got nothing against NRDC. The problem is that when the environmental movement began, it was just like the fracking movement today. People were wearing gas masks, waving signs, we were running around like lunatics. I went to the first Earth Day in 1970 in the Capitol, and Nelson Rockefeller signed something. And I thought he cleaned up the environment. I was almost moved to tears. I'm sure he just proclaimed Earth Day, right? So I worked for Environmental Defense Fund, you know, and they were just amazingly radical. But over the course of time, you know, NRDC and EDF and these big groups just don't want to get involved with fights. And so they don't want to get into a knockdown, drag out fight on fracking. And they're always proposing a soft landing. They never criticize the governor. I mean, that's just where they're at. And so they try to, you know, kind of propose something that didn't seem so bad, you know, and it would impact these five, you know, counties where there aren't a whole lot of people. And they believe that natural gas is a bridge fuel to sustainable futures and all these kinds of things. But I encourage you, call Peter Laner. Tell him Walter Hang asked you to give him a call. You're very troubled about the position. Call Kate Sinding, call Eric, um, you know, Goldstein. I mean, just, this is all about, you know, shaping the way that they think. I'll tell you a hilarious story. One day I get a call from this person and they say, you know, we saw your letter opposing this demonstration project in the Southern Tier and we, and we want to uh, work with you on that. I had no idea who these people were, so they, I helped them draft a little note, which was sent to uh, Francis Beinecke, who was at the time, I think, the president of NRDC. And so it says, we're unalterably opposed uh, to shale fracking demonstration projects in the southern tier. Francis writes back and says, we're not changing our position. So it turns out that the woman who wrote this letter, or actually sent the letter, 
Uh, she's married to a guy worth $8 billion. And it turns out she's on the NRDC board. So the year before, she had given NRDC a million dollars as a contribution. She cut it in half after she got Francis's response. So again, we're trying to cobble together a very, very sophisticated, aware coalition that starts at the grassroots. It's very, very hard, you know, to bet on that kind of lucky break. Uh, but, but again, hold them accountable. Hold everyone accountable. Hold us accountable. If we make all kinds of promises, we don't do it. You know, then you say, "Hey, I didn't like that." Right? That's the name of the game. What can be done about pipelines and the damage that they do in and of themselves uh, as a step towards fracking? Um, we've seen a lot of explosions. Uh, we see that there are at least the big fight over Keystone uh, with the uh, tar sands down through the center of the country. Um, again, is the, do you see these as like huge monumental fights and what we have to do in New York State is stop fracking here? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, these fights are, are ongoing. They're tying up communities all over the state. When the big issue is fracking having not yet started in the state, it's, it's pulling all this energy. So where we're all in one big effort together, it's really pulling on people's time and resources. Pipelines, compressor stations, um, there's just a myriad of issues that people are concerned about. Of course, you're first going to step in and try to help in your own community, but it is to all tied together. And like Walter said about the export stations, um, some of it is beyond New York State control. It's, it's FERC, it's the Federal uh, Environmental Regulatory Commission. And so these are fights that aren't necessarily, I mean, I think it's worth letting them know um, that there's such strong opposition, but they're not necessarily ones that everyone's finding they're winning. The easiest thing you can do if you're concerned about a pipeline project or an alignment that's already in place, you can go to my free map, toxicstargeting.com, and then just look at the map. I mean, these pipelines have enormous problems. <laughs> Uh, and so you can see, maybe there's some big spills and maybe you can get the data. You can call me, you know, 800-286-9427 and, and I, you know, will talk to you without charge. But these fights are very, very complicated and tough. And so you're not going to be able to beat a billion dollar pipeline project by forwarding emails in the middle of the night. You're going to need a really organized campaign. And regarding Keystone XL, I mean, They've blocked this one pipeline, and it's a biggie, that brings the crude oil from the Bakken Shale in North Dakota and from Alberta tar sands. But by blocking that, they didn't block the crude oil coming into America. Canada now is producing some staggering amount of oil, and that's combined with Bakken Shale. How does it get into New York? It comes by tanker cars. So when I was in Syracuse in January, dropping off my son at the bus station, I see this huge tanker car train. And so those trains are very problematic. If you get a derailment, you can have a fire, you can have an explosion. But for me, I don't work on any of that because I can barely work on the S guys in the Department of Health Review. It's zero sum game. So if you're inclined to work on these fights, pause, <laughs> try to sort out what the best order is for you to do, and then make good decisions. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your elected leaders and see, you know, you can't fight everything. You have to pick your fights to some extent. And there is a very complicated series of, you know, strategic decisions that are underway. Um, and to that, uh, we have a question uh, about uh, the Spectrum Pipeline and, um, it, and what did I do uh, to stop it. We, you know, sent letters to FERC, um, but, you know, there are... Uh, limited ways in which you can, you know, there were meetings with our federal officials, there are very limited ways in which you can uh, derail that. Um, I've chosen to put most of my energy uh, into uh, the fracking issue because in the state legislature I have a role with, that where I can be effective and helpful uh, and that's, 
you know, I'm not the Congress member, I'm the Assembly member, and that's where I put my energy. Um, not that I don't think that the folks who were deeply committed to uh, that battle were wrong. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, you have to pick your fights. And we did what we could, knowing that it was a federal steamroller that we were unlikely to derail. Um, I think we know that we, uh, we want you to have an opportunity to write letters and we don't want everybody there at the same time. So I think we'll just take one final question. Um, while downstate may be worrying about our water supply contamination, I'd like to know where is the outrage in the county where fracking has been proposed. And I think you see a fair amount of it up there. So uh, take a drive on um, Route 206, uh, and um, you'll see uh, probably in some places, um, in Shenango certainly where I've been, uh, you'll see some friends of natural gas, those are the bad people, uh, and then you'll just see van fracking um, and other handwritten signs. Uh, so, um, one that I loved was, water has kept us alive since BC, <laughs> uh, which I think kind of put, says it all, uh, but um, uh, maybe you could just give us a, 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 some closing thoughts as we wrap up on, on that. Well, the outrage is certainly there. Uh, it's interesting because as I was thinking about Walter's presentation, I was thinking how I hadn't stated kind of the, the mindset in that area. Um, initially, a lot of people hadn't heard about it. They weren't approached for a lease. Everyone was mum about it, except the, the town boards. Uh, the supervisors of the towns definitely knew about the issue. And um, some of our problem has been that a lot of them are the big landowners. They traditionally have been, and they've been in office for maybe a long time. So as people did start talking to one another, they went through the usual emotions of, you know, terror, outrage, um, and then either you get depressed or you decide to do something about it. And as uh, people came together to start doing something about it, we started to realize just how many of us there were, uh, especially if it had just been town by town, these are little towns, maybe be a few people going to a town board meeting and being told, no, we're not addressing that. So five guys are making decisions about what really would come up. And that's important to think about when you think about these bans, how hard it's been to kind of even consider them in that area. Because if someone stands to make a lot of money personally, they of course are not going to want that to come up. Um, it's going to take a lot of pressure. That pressure's been building though because people have been finding one another. And so there are some stretches where you can go through upstate and depending on particularly the proximity of some of this infrastructure coming towards them, um, or the amount of leasing that perhaps is taking, taking place in an area, um, you will see a lot of signage where people have said, I can't remain silent any longer. I'm not going to stop being intimidated to say something. And it's rural. There are, uh, everyone's up there for the peace and the quiet. They're not used to putting themselves out there, but increasingly they are. And, um, and it's growing, and I would say it's just increasing all the time. And even people who originally might have thought this would save the farm or, or whatever they were thinking, um, where they had either entertained the lease, possibly signed one, uh, some of those same people are saying, I've made a mistake. And that's a very hard thing to do. Very hard thing to do. And because they're such small areas, if it's a really contentious issue, we've had to find a way to talk to one another about it. And there's some people that will still just get up and scream and yell um, that they want it and don't want to hear anything else. But if you really look your neighbor in the eye and you realize, really, what we've been doing, we've been doing to each other, it's a different story. Keep asking, Aaron. The reality is that 73 of those communities have signed resolutions. They can't wait to get natural gas fracking. So these are very conservative areas politically. 
These are the proverbial Republicans that are to the right of Attila the Hot. I mean, they just want to do whatever they want to do. They hate government. They hate regulation. They love fracking. They want fracking. It's a political fight, right? So they have their point of view. We have maybe a different point of view, but the bottom line is, you know, we've out-organized them. I mean, and, and we've been very fortunate, but we're not out of the woods yet. So um, you've heard about the problems. You've heard about the things that we're doing. I encourage you. Go to ToxicsTargeting.com, click on Marcella Shale, sign one of the coalition letters, you know, learn about it if you want to, but the key